Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? I think some people are still joining us. Um, very excited to be with you today. I'm Amal Andraus. I'm the Dean of the school. Very excited to be speaking with Malo Hudson, um, who has been at GSAP for a number of years, uh, both as director of the urban planning um, PhD program, as well as the director of the Urban Community and Health Equity Lab. And one of the reasons why I wanted to speak with Malo um, today is, well, two reasons. One is at times the PhDs are somewhat um, obscure from, in terms of their work from the rest of the school. And I think the, the work is so crucial, uh, especially at this moment, that I, I wanted to give the opportunity for Malo to share his thoughts about um, where urban planning, both as a discipline and as a practice, are going. But also because Malo has been uh, very much involved at the university with Columbia World Projects for a couple of years, and he's sort of coming back, and uh, so I, it's a kind of welcome back. <laughs> and you know, I, Malo Hudson's focus is incredibly timely. Uh, in many ways, um, he is a scholar, but his scholarship is very much a sort of engaged form of scholarship, which was one of the reasons why I was very excited that he joined uh, this GSAP a few years ago. Um, and this capacity to both be, or to be at the same time, a public intellectual, someone who really works with the community in a very engaged way, but also advises government, works on policy, this sort of cross-disciplinary, even within planning. Um, I think is incredibly uh, important. And at the same time, the topics uh, at the intersection of health, uh, race, uh, issues of equity, development, uh, questions of scale, uh, you know, how does one think about, uh, you know, uh, sort of addressing issues at a community scale when the issues are much broader than the scale of that particular community. So that thinking across scale is very GSAP and, and very important to us. And, and, you know, not taking for granted that uh, environmental, what we think of as environmental actions that are positive are necessarily positive. I, I think um, Malo's research has often uh, sort of focused on questions of environmental gentrification and how certain kind of uh, um, policies, certain, certain, you know, as architects, as planners, when we intervene, uh, sometimes the consequences on on the kind of on, on issues of health on equity uh, um, are, are not are not where what they are intended to be um, and so both you know I want to first talk about uh, Malo your vision for the PhD program because I think that you know typically we think about um, that program as very much focused on the discipline itself and a sort of introspection but at the same time I think your approach is opening up to possibilities for engagement, for action. Uh, yes. And then want to talk about your lab as well, which is your sure. own practice, so. Sure, well, well, first of all, I want to thank everyone for joining us today and Amal for that wonderful um, and warm introduction. I have to say, this is my start of my fourth year at Columbia now. It's unbelievable how fast time goes. No, and, and it seems like just yesterday I arrived um, and now I'm starting my fourth year. And, you know, it, I, I have to say that, you know, obviously we're living in some uh, historical times, very challenging times, but I also look at it as an opportunity. Um, and if we think about a PhD program, I mean, there are traditional programs where you are an academic, you come in, you, you focus on theory, you write your papers, you write your books, you go get tenure, uh, you know, whatnot, and much of your work might sit on a shelf. I mean, obviously, uh, or it just touches a small group of people. I think that you know, when you think about what the role of the 21st century university is, it's not just to produce research and scholarship. Obviously, you want to provide service to your discipline. But I think more importantly, we have to start thinking about what is the broader purpose or what, you know, President Bollinger and others have talked about as the fourth purpose of the university. And I think with our PhD program, which is couched in a professional school, it's important to think about the opportunities. So obviously, we want to attract some of the best minds in the world, uh, great scholars who are thinking outside the box, have great methodologies, sound research, but at the same time, what is the outcome of that work? Uh, we want people actually to go out and to uh, solve some of these challenging problems that we face. And so as scholars, and I, I know many PhD students are uh, you know, on, on Zoom right now listening to me, 
uh, oftentimes we're isolated. We wonder if our work has any impact because a dissertation is very lonely when you write it, right? You have a small group of a small community. And so uh, it's nice to understand like how will your work really actually have some impact. So first and foremost, I think our PhD program is focused on theory and practice. And we want those great minds to say, not only will we come in and focus, whether it be around climate change, housing discrimination, the built environment and health, urban analytics, uh, what have you. There are a number of, of areas, and I can dive into more specifics later about some of the work that students are doing. But it's to say, we, once I graduate, what kind of jobs will I go out and have, right? And so it's not just the theory and practice, but a great PhD program can be able to point to and say, here are where our graduates are. Um, I, I've come from a little bit of both of a theory and practice background as well as a more traditional type of PhD, you know, PhD programs where I've taught. And I think it's important to say, look, uh, we have students that go into academia. We have students that go into tr actually policy research think tanks. We have students who are entrepreneurs. We have students that work for international organizations, whether it be NGOs or whatnot, we have, uh, all the way down to working for city governments, state governments, federal governments, and so forth. So I think for us, as I try to, and I know my colleagues feel very similar, is to not just attract students that are just a prototype, but students that actually will go out into institutions and organizations and go out to the real world and take their research and scholarship to actually have impact on systems change, on policy, and so forth. I'm sorry, you, I think you might be muted, Amal. Yes, I think, hey, I, think okay. I, I, was, I was being muted. So, um, and, and, the other aspect of that, and then this is where maybe I want to tie it already with the lab, is, you know, it's kind of new forms of practice, in fact, that I think is very, uh, that, at, you know, at GSAP we're really interested in and how you're, you know, you're developing your research and your scholarship through, you know, what, how does the lab kind of impact and intervenes? Because I think that is an interesting model for exactly, you know, the kinds of engagements that you're describing, right? That you could, you could That's right. almost. Yeah, and I, and I think it's, it's important to go back to the doctoral program for a second about that is that, you know, and to make it personal, I think, you know, I'm right. speaking to a large audience today, but I'm really speaking also right now to our doctoral students and people are right. interested in uh, pursuing a doctorate degree. My, you have to think about your personal life and sort of is your life separate from your work, so to speak. And for me, they're the same. Right. You know, I walk through life and, and I, the kind of work I do is the kind of life I try to live. So I'm very much obviously interested in the built environment and health equity. And so they're not separate from me. So everything I do is related to also my research for the most part, right? I, I obviously, I'm a, a father, I have children, all those things. But um, at the end of the day, it's they're not separate. And so for some people, you have to decide what kind of scholar do you want to be? Do you want to be one that says, this is kind of the other that I study? And then I have that separation, or is it something that you immerse yourself in and it's everything you do? It's, it's you know, you breathe and, and, and I know our students are like that, full of, full of energy and they, they just live and breathe it. And so with our doctoral program, it is tailored for that. It is a small boutique program where we generally have three students a year that come in. And what we want them to do is to have that flexibility to obviously understand what happens in urban planning, uh, what the big issues are, which I can touch on in a second, but more importantly, branching out across Columbia University, across New York City, and of course the world, to figure out where do I fit, what kind of resources I need to bring to the table, and who's asking important questions. I mean, I wish I could sit here and tell you, urban planners, we have all the great uh, solutions. We don't. We have great ideas, but also in public health and sociology and anthropology, and you know, we can go on and on, and architecture. So the question is, can you be the type of scholar that can understand when you're faced with a complex issue such as climate change and say, who do I need to be at the table uh, either through my research as well as thinking about these solutions to have these conversations. So some of the best growing I've ever done is when I've had a conversation with colleagues in other disciplines and they say, oh, that's interesting. You think about it this way. Here's how we think about a particular issue. Uh, so I've learned, you know, I've had colleagues that are doctors and engineers and, and doing all kinds of great research. And I never thought uh, when I was a finishing a postdoc through the Robert Johnson Health and Society Scholars Program at the University of Michigan, I was having these detailed conversations with the neurosurgeon, right, from Johns Hopkins, but very interested in similar things, health equity, but in an international context. He was doing a lot of work with colleagues in Ethiopia, and there, was, there were issues, obviously, with uh, 
trauma and whatnot. And so how do you then kind of think about the broader community? And that's where he came to me and said, can we have a conversation about how do you build community? How do you think about the infrastructure in order to even provide adequate health care and access and all those things? So I say all of that because I think it, you know, oftentimes when students ask me, should I pursue a PhD or not? And, you know, are PhDs even relevant? I would say, look, it's a personal issue. I think if you want to pursue a PhD, first and foremost, you must have passion to want to do research, to want to, to, to uh, use your research for policy change and to engage at the local level and whatnot, and obviously globally. But more importantly, like, is it something that you can commit to over time and is it part of who you are in your everyday life? So I, I wanted to put all that out there because I think it's important uh, to understand what kind of scholar you want to be. And I'm not passing judgment if some scholars who say, I do my work, I go home and I do something else. And on the weekends or the week summers, I do my, that, that's one way of doing scholarship. But I think given the complexity, if we think about where the world is going, the world's urbanizing, we know there's great inequalities. We know there are issues around water access, air quality. Um, you know, we have the global pandemic that, that we're dealing with now. I mean, we can go on and on. We already know what many of the challenges are and we're gonna keep studying what and more will come up. But the real question is then, what are the solutions to those problems, right? It's not just enough for you to say, gee, the world's messed up, there's unemployment, there's poverty, there's inequality, and keep documenting it. Like, it's all important, we must document it. We must approach it from a, a, a very uh, methodical scientific way. But at the end of the day, what are you going to do about it, right? Are you training students to go out and change the world? Are you working with colleagues who are working on real world projects? So that's really the nice segue into what I've been trying to do with the Urban Community and Health Equity Lab, which, you know, you obviously were uh, very supportive of, uh, supportive of that. And one of the reasons why I came to Columbia and, and certainly uh, with, to GSAP is because I wanted to be able to uh, think about the built environment in a different way, branch out across uh, Columbia and New York City, and, and also globally to say, how can we try to solve some of these more complex issues, right? I mean, obviously I'm just one person and we're all just individual scholars, but together you could really bring about the change that many people have been asking for, right? That we see now that we're in the middle of. Um, and so I think what better time than to be studying, whether it be architecture, urban design, urban planning, it's the, the challenges are daunting at times, but it's also exciting thinking about the challenges that exist and the, the ability to go out and think about how does the built environment impact people's lives? What are the issues around spatial inequality? What are the, you know, what institutions are, are providing kind of the solutions that we need and which ones are a relic and need to be shaken up and to be torn down and to be rebuilt? Uh, so all those things, sorry to go on and on, but I think it's important to have that conversation first with yourself. And then more importantly, think about the community of scholars that you embed yourself around, right? And so which type of people do you surround yourself with? Especially for doctoral students, writing a dissertation can be very lonely, but where do you find your inspiration or where do you go to, to uh, see the world through a different lens? And for me, that is talking to colleagues in other disciplines, going out to meet with people who are actually doing the, what I sometimes joke and call the real work. They're out on the front lines every day, whether it be community organizing, whether it be providing social services, whether it be building build, real buildings, right? I could talk about it, they are actually building it. And so how do you then learn from them to make sure that you're uh, improving every day and so forth, so. And, <clears throat> thanks, Marlo. And one of the things that I, I think is, is maybe a, a shift, something we've talked about, uh, um, you know, we've often talked about the divorce between, I mean, you, you're mentioning sort of all these kind of other disciplines and reaching out, but sometimes, you know, the divorce between architecture and planning. I mean, we, we even at GSAP, right, the, there's a sort of, we're, we're, we're trying to stitch things back together um, with you, with Wei Ping. Uh, I, I think more and more architecture students, design students are interested in policy. And yeah. at the same time, you've looked, you've kind of anchored issues of health in place, right? You, you've brought back, um, you know, you, 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 you are holding together the kind of social sciences, but also bringing them back as a planner to place and to the importance of the physical and the built environment in affecting um, issues of equity, yeah. issues of social justice. And, and I think that that is, I don't know that people appreciate the, the sort of the progress, let's say that we've made in trying to, because if we are going to address um, those very large scale um, sort of concerns, climate change, equity, you know, unless we stitch back together all these scales and these modes of, 
uh, sort of engagement is going to be very difficult. And I, th I think that's kind of very sort of, sort of different uh, in terms of your own approach. Yes. In the same way that you sort of hybridize the kind of theoretical and the practical and this, this notion of a very engaged um, form of uh, research and scholarship on the ground and working with communities yes. while also writing and theorizing about, um, you know, as, as, as in your, your book, right, The Urban Struggle for Economic, Environmental and Social Justice, you kind of give very specific examples of your engagement with communities relative to institutions, which of course at Columbia is you know, quite interesting to think yes. about. And so um, just wanted to highlight why this is a little bit of a, you know, a kind of movement that is really encouraging, let's say. Well, well, first of all, I, I really appreciate that question and those comments, because I think it's, it's really important to, you know, I could sit here and say, like, you can work with colleagues here and think about the world. Look, but the best advice I ever got as a young scholar was to learn a case, right? So Manuel Castells was one of my great advisors at Berkeley, and then I went off to MIT. And he always said to me, make sure you learn a case or learn something specific that you really understand. And then from that case, go learn another case and then do comparative analysis and build from there. And so I start to do that. I, obviously, my work is rooted in community development. Uh, health equity came much later. Actually, subconsciously, I was always concerned about health equity, but I didn't have the language or the, the, the framework or the methodologies that I got from my colleagues in, in the public health realm and, and in medicine but really understanding like what's happening in a community. And from there, I was talking to people, which now makes a lot of sense. I mean, we've, we've read the uh, different books like Root, Root Shock, but I saw people where their neighborhoods were changing and there was a tremendous amount of stress and anxiety and trauma and anger and frustration and hopelessness and, and, and feeling helpless. And, you know, so I couldn't put my finger on it, but I just thought something's happening. I was engaging with people. Uh, they were working really hard. They were investing. And yet they said, no matter how hard, we try to invest in a particular community. There are other things we can't control, whether it be the global economy, whether it be investment. I mean, many of the things you had alluded to earlier. And from there, you start to understand kind of, um, certainly from a researcher's perspective, but where people are really coming from and trying to listen to what their needs are and what their concerns are and understanding you're not the expert, but you do have skills that you can bring to the table that can help them. And so in the case, when I was a doctoral student in Boston, you know, I started to be very, I was always interested in the, you know, uh, poverty and equality from a long time, from my early days at Berkeley as undergraduate and then a grad student. Uh, but I, I wanted to understand more of like, how does it actually operate? And so I started to just poke around through Boston, go out to different neighborhoods. And I started to meet people in Roxbury and South End and different places. And there's a similar story that started to arise, right? Is people, as I said before, felt helpless, they felt the changes. And from there, I just wanted to know more of like what was actually happening. And you know, to, to make a long story short, you, you, we obviously know what was happening. There's all the, a movement back to cities and what, you know, well-documented gentrification, certainly in the US context, but also globally. And then as I started to do more, you know, have the opportunity to travel more broadly, not necessarily for research, but to give talks and to meet with colleagues, whether it be in South America or Europe, uh, you start as, I started to see similar stories. And you start to realize, gee, the struggle in East Oakland, California is a similar struggle in the south side of Chicago, which is the same st struggle in East London versus like going to Santiago, Chile, right? The struggle is very similar, Bogota, what have you. Um, and so the question is then, if this is happening globally and these issues are central to people's lives, what can you do in terms of, for me, this is, I'm speaking more personally now, what could I do as a researcher uh, to try to produce a scholarship that actually is applicable, replicable, and scalable, right? Because at the end of the day, what's the point of having this nice boutique uh, program if it can't be replicated? If you can't take it to scale, if you can't measure it, understand what the actual impact is. And, you know, oftentimes we talk about impact, we're always talking about the positive impacts. But sometimes programs have negative impacts, unintended consequences. So when I say impact, I mean both positive and negative. Being able to measure those things and understand but then to understand who are your colleagues, that's one of the things, surround yourself around other wonderful scholars that share your passion, share your interest, to then branch out and have those conversations with them and find out, oh, what's happening in, in Nairobi is the same thing that might be happening somewhere else, and then how we can work together to create a more of a global uh, community of scholars, but more importantly, to bring about real change. Sorry to get, but the scale piece is incredibly, incredibly important, and I didn't want to gloss over that, so I really appreciate the question, because I think 
sometimes it's easy for me now as a tenured faculty member who's been teaching now about 14 years, 15 years, to say, oh, I'm doing all these things, but I had to start somewhere. And I started in a neighborhood, right? Really, it, as an undergraduate at Berkeley in East Oakland and West Oakland, and then from there, doing a little bit more work in San Francisco, and then Bayview Hunters Point, uh, and then Richmond, and then obviously branching out to Boston, elsewhere. And I think it's, it's, a, it's really interesting. It's a question of scale, but also as a, as a planner, you're really connecting local conditions to, to global. You're thinking relationally uh, across these different cities and these different contexts, and certainly, um, you know, at GSA, but also in the urban planning program, I'm thinking about Heba Bo Akar, who's kind yes. of tying conditions in the Middle East to yeah. conditions in, in Latin America, or Wei Ping Wu, who's really focusing on, on Asia and, and, and thinking relationally even across cities um, in, in China. Lance Freeman's work is much more anchored in New York, et cetera. So I, th I think that sort of community is very um, sort of, it's been very interesting to trace how these themes are cutting across place and scale and, and kind of connecting um, the, the lo local and the global. And one of the big, I mean, devastating equalizer right now is COVID-19. And I know that this sits exactly at the heart of your scholarship and research, um, you know, and there's been so many uh, questions about the future of cities or the, you know, like what is the, what is the future impact of COVID-19 sure. potentially and, and whether, um, you know, this is a kind of, are we, are we going to see cities uh, empty again? <clears throat> and, and, you know, at, at the, at the, at, you know, at the moment when we're supposed to be densifying in some ways and minimizing footprint on the planet, is there uh, again, a sort of exodus uh, and, you know, along socioeconomic lines also. And so I, I was curious, I know you've been speaking quite a bit about yes. uh, COVID-19 and, and it's, you know, what you can imagine its impact uh, might be. And I was curious to hear a little bit your thoughts about that as well. Yeah, so so obviously it's, uh, you know, COVID-19 is a, a major pandemic that's affecting all of us. And, you know, one of the things I try to do is not be, uh, to try not to predict the future, right? Because you, as soon as you do that, you're wrong uh, oftentimes. But I will say that, I, why don't I talk about what I see as potential implications and, and what we can decide as a society of what, what we want to do. So let's think first and foremost, the impact of COVID-19 and the disproportionate impact it's had on communities of color and poor and vulnerable populations, whether it be elderly and whatnot, and sort of how it's exposed, and you know, I, obviously the world, but certainly in the United States, how it's exposed the system that we thought we had in place, our uh, healthcare system, that many people said, well, it can handle this. It's, it's on the brink of, of, it's under major stress, and in many places might be on the brink of collapsing. It's uh, brought a big, flashed a, a huge light on our inequality, and which is no surprise to all of us, but, but if we start to dig a little bit deeper of terms of your insurance is tied to your job. Uh, your, if you are a working parent and your children can't go to school, how can you also take care of your children through Zoom and do all those things and also work, right? And so, uh, the people who have been unemployed were, you know, between 30 to 40 million Americans are unemployed, if not more, right? And so the, it's, it's had devastating impacts. And then if you go down to specific levels, what we we're talking about New York City, of looking at those who have the means to either protect themselves or live in situations where they can avoid, they're not frontline workers, right? They're not part of the frontline workforce versus those that are. So if we looked at the New York State controllers, offer us 75% of, of uh, frontline workers. So those are oftentimes childcare providers, transit workers, grocery store clerks, um, you know, uh, Uber and Lyft drivers. So 75% are people of color. And so when you say stay at home or social distance, it's very difficult for certain populations to do that. Or if you're in a situation where there's overcrowding, we know New York City is extremely expensive. Or if you're talking about another city around the world, the kind of cost and the things that people do to survive uh, whether it be extended families, whether it be friends, what, what have you, we all know those stories. Again, that becomes a problem. So for me, those are all the things that it's exposing. The real question is then how as a society do we respond to that, right? Do we sort of just say, let's just keep moving on, the economy can't uh, stop. I mean, if you look at CNBC or Wall Street, or what pandemic, what inequality, what, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm always, I always like to see what's happening in the, in the financial world. So then 
it's clear that people are living different realities, right? And, and so when we go to have a conversation, whether it be through social media or, or forums, and this is why I think, you know, universities play such an important role right now, where are people getting their, like, where are people able to share their experiences of like, well, you see New York may be great for you, but it's awful for me because of these reasons. Now we know it's a wonderful city. So as we think about the future, um, we, have to, we have to also think about technology and surveillance. We have to think about space. So even in a time of a global pandemic, how do we reimagine space in a city? Do we still need all the cars clogging up all our streets? Or can we think of something different of having, creating new plazas for people to come out and interact? And I know within GSAP, you know, I, I'm not gonna pretend to know more than many of our great students and my other colleagues across the different disciplines that have been all over this information, uh, all over this issue and are coming up with wonderful solutions. And I, and I remember during the, Final reviews for studio. I mean, just my, they were just mind blowing some of the ideas that our students had and faculty around how we can reimagine the city. So there, there's that. But then, you know, I also wonder from an urban planning perspective, if you think about people social distancing or working for home, I'm hearing obviously it has a big impact on commercial real estate and the real estate market in New York and other places might uh, certainly Silicon Valley. Um, they're sort of wondering what the long term consequences might this might this have. But I, I th also worry about employers saying, you know, we're, we're actually fine with a 30% less workforce. We're actually doing okay, right? But then what's happening if, in the fall when the parents' kids don't go to school? Or it's, so, you know, I, it, it's really difficult to say. I will, I will tell you, I took a very, uh, I conducted a very important scientific poll uh, with my students. <laughs> And they, and in the spring, and I asked, how many of you, given the situation, plan to leave cities and, and not one person uh, raise their hand? Now, obviously, it's a biased sample, but not one person. So uh, it tells me there's something that draws us to cities. Uh, certainly, there's the, the life of the city, interacting with people, the, the rhythm of the subway and buses and whatnot. So there's something magical about cities and wonderful about cities. And there's also the other side, but I don't know long term will this really impact it may slow the you know obviously people moving to cities some people are going to move out but will it you know will new york still be new york 10 years from now absolutely i think so it's also it's also been really fascinating because on the one hand right covid had this effect of depleting cities and voiding them and then black lives matter and the move you know and the protests and this kind of life and solidarity and, and, you know, public space was again, you know, like the, at the heart of um, social political, you know, transformation. And so these, these two things are obviously connected, but sort of intention to reclaim actually public, to reclaim the physical as crucial to advancing, um, the, you know, um, equity, racial equity, democracy, you know, that, that in the end it came down to we have to be together in public space. And that's been such a powerful reassertion of, of, of the physical, of the public space. And I think what you're mentioning is fascinating in terms of how do we then take these two things together and rethink the relationship of yes. infrastructure to housing, to outdoor, right? Someone who has a balcony is gonna do better than someone who doesn't have a balcony. Yes. I mean, these little, these little details that come down to how do you, you know, all these old questions of uh, light and air and, you know, suddenly take on a real uh, urgency again uh, of, of, you know, what, what, you know, how do we create um, communities um, that sort of can sustain one another, um, so. That's right. And I mean, I, if you look at, obviously, the, all the data coming out of around COVID-19 and who's being impacted, right? So we saw how, uh, Obviously, communities of color, as I mentioned, and vulnerable populations are being devastated in many places, whether it be New Orleans, New York, Chicago, I can go on and on. And certainly we see what's happening now with the data coming in from South America. Uh, and then you, you then put in, as you said, uh, of, of seeing, I mean, it's, it's the same story, the same nightmare of police brutality, of the murdering of George, George Floyd. And, you know, it, it, it just, you know, many people ask me, well, what happened? Like, that George Floyd was the, you know, it was, it was, it was already uh, a fire that was burning underneath, right? It, underneath the ground. And that was just the final thing that people just like, enough's enough. I mean, at some point you have to start looking at what's happening in our society. And what I say, and, and that's why I really think that what we're studying 
and our disciplines are so critical. And I, obviously everyone thinks that, and I think there are many, but you know, we're, we're, we're in the GSAP world right now. So uh, just, I wanna, I wanna put a qualifier out there, is space and how people interact or don't interact. I mean, I remember when I was living in the Bay Area uh, in Berkeley, and with the rise of Silicon Valley, there were people I knew didn't even have to interact with people anymore. They Uber, Lyft, or they have a private car, to, didn't take public transit, transportation, start bringing up questions of like, should we even fund transportation, right? And I, obviously that's crazy. And so what we need to think about is the questions around the protests that we see now, as certainly around the you know, anti-black racism, racism, obviously in general, is how do we use our tax dollars how do we use our funding, uh, you know, just overall or, or prioritize our funding for various things? How much of it goes into actual community investment? How much of it goes into education? How much of it goes into supporting a family that's working or a, a single parent or what, what have you? I mean, there are many ways to prioritize how we think about our funding and the kind of society that we want to see. And one of the most important things around that is our communities. And I bring that more, I'm using the word community more broadly, but our housing, our infrastructure, the schools, the social services, the, the, the open spaces, access. I mean, it just raises a whole host of things. And we're all angry, right? I know people are, are furious. And, and, you know, 2020 has been one hell of a year for everyone, but it's a year we will never forget. And the question is, as a society and as people, how do we respond to this challenge, right? And that's, I would hate, uh, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, or say we're having this conversation looking back on, and I'm looking back on my career, I would hate to keep doing the same research I'm doing now and still talking about these great inequalities and inequities and injustices and so forth, and just have a collection of books and articles that just document what great researchers before me have done and before them and so forth. I would love to sit back and be old as I joke with my students and be sitting at home and see them on TV or see their policies or their elected officials and know that they're actually changing the world and doing the things that we've talked about in the classroom, but taking a step further, innovating in ways that my brain can't even uh, conceptualize because you know, I'm at a point in my life where you, you're stuck in your ways in a certain, way, certain point and that's what the young people are for, to come and to shake you up and to push it further and go further and further and further. Well, before I, I wanna make sure we open it up for yes. some questions, um, but I just want to make a, a leap to, you know, not a leap, but I, I think what, what, what COVID, what, uh, what Black Lives Matter, what, you know, all of this is highlighting the intertwining between environment, right, also between climate change and how climate change is necessarily going to impact, you know, uh, underserved communities, uh, 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 communities of color, vulnerable communities, black people, you know, I mean, like, like yeah. anyone in the world who is sort of vulnerable is going to be significantly more impacted um, by climate change. And so I wanted to kind of tie because that is also at the center of your work. And I think at the center of what you, where you're taking the program, the question of environmental justice and how the, these two things are connected. And that this notion that we, we actually might not, we won't be able to, to address climate change if we don't address these inequities socially and, and, and along kind of questions of racial equity and. No, and I'm, I'm glad to, yeah, that's another uh, great question, which is why you know, you're who you are. But when you think about, obviously everything we're dealing with is, is, is uh, intense, but you know, as I say, probably the one, one of the most important things in our lives right now is climate change and the impact of climate change on, for all of us. And, you know, I've been uh, over the last few years, I'd say the five years or so, really diving deep more into the circular economy, circular city work. And I think that um, as we start to dive in, you see, we have some real challenges with our systems, right? Many of our students that we attract to GSAP, this is what they're passionate about. They've been doing it in the real world and, and whatnot, or they'll go out and do it. And it, you start to see how uh, the question is, will the, our capitalist system, the way it's structured, uh, does it, in fact, uh, you know, is it, is it compatible with the kind of lifestyle we want, right? Not saying to change, cap I'm not saying that we have to overthrow capitalism or some, but the way it's structured, right? We know that it's not a free market, so to speak, or is that like, it's actually uh, regulated. There are laws, there are regulations, and if Wall Street or businesses run into trouble, there's government that continually bails them out. So the real question is then is we can have a say-so in that, 
And as we think about a circular economy or a circular city where there's zero waste, and we really start to think about real carbon emissions and, 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 so, and how do we put a price tag on things? That's where I think the real important work begins as we start to think about, well, what is a price for a ton of carbon? I mean, many of uh, the brilliant minds of the world are working on that. And at Columbia World Projects, I was working with colleagues that are trying to figure that out to, to basically take direct, direct air capture of carbon out of the air and put it in basalt rock off the coast of Canada as a pilot project. But at the end of the day, as you start to think about whether it be fast fashion, whether it be the building materials that we can you know, use for our buildings, uh, all the, the things that are working or not working, there are many opportunities to engage from the product level, whether we're talking about the design of shoes, to computers, to buildings and neighborhoods and so forth. And, and really thinking about how do you put a price on some of the things that a, a traditional economist might say, uh, you know, it's hard to price or we don't know because we're focusing on either shareholder profits and whatnot. I think we have to start thinking about what is the price of society? What is the price for the environment? What is the price for it not being there any longer, right? And so you look at the work of many great colleagues at, at Columbia uh, that I've been chatting with, and they're trying to really think about those things of what happens when you don't have open space? What happens when, you know, we're not, we're not replenishing our forests and so forth? I mean, all of what we all on this uh, Zoom uh, gathering understand, but it's taking a step further and really saying, how do you implement it? It's another thing to talk about it, but a city like New York or, or Mumbai or Beijing or what have you, how do you actually go about implementing it in a way that you could actually see tangible results and not doing it from, a, from an ivory tower perspective, meaning it's easy for me to sit here today and say, these are all things we have to do with it. Well, guess what? For every choice we make, those are jobs that are lost. Those are families that are hurt. Those are, right? So you have to do a trade-off to say, if you have this option, or if you make this decision, what other uh, ways are we helping other people to have other options to do other things? Um, so, yeah. I'm muted. Yes. And we're, how are we on time right now? I don't have a I clock. I think we have, we have about 20 minutes. So okay. I, know, I know that we're going to take questions. Um, Lila, did you want to, s how, we, or how are we doing the questions? So we'll take questions in the chat. Um, I okay. encourage anyone who would like to ask a question to type it into the chat and then I will read it into, um, into the meeting. We want to make sure that we are accommodating of folks who are just on the phone. Um, so if anyone has a question for Dr. Huts Hudson or for Dean Andraus, um, please go ahead and type it into the chat now. Um, Matt, did you want to do the presentations? You know, why don't I, why don't I just yes. talk? I could just do a brief while, while people think of questions. Why don't I just give you an overview of the yes, lab? That, that'll be great. That yeah, um, I think that, I think that's the approach. You know, I've, I've talked a lot about sort of the the theory and practice, but like let's you talk about the it work. In yeah. world. So, Lila, if you don't if you don't mind putting it up, I can just I'll go through it briefly with the um, Urban Community Health Equity Lab, which is based in GSAP and housed in GSAP. It really is meant to break down the barriers in academia, the silos. So it's, it's, it's looking at architecture, it's looking at urban design, historic preservation, sociology, public health, what have you. And it's uh, to work with people across those disciplines, not only within the academy, but also in the, in the real world and globally. So thinking about scale. And it, I really focus on uh, three areas. And, and Lila, you could, I don't know if I'm in control, but you could just uh, move it forward. And I'll, I'll, I'll go through that. I've, kind of, I've talked about my research, but I focus on really three areas within the lab, uh, the built environment and health, community development and uh, urban sustainability or circular economy is this kind of a second area. And the third is, is uh, law and governance. So Lila, if you go to the next slide, um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, so with the built environment, natural environment and health, it goes to what much of what I was discussing today is really thinking about housing, transportation, parks, open space, infrastructure, all of the things that matter for our cities, our metropolitan areas, and, and why it's important, obviously, for health. Um, I am involved with a, a National Science Foundation proposal that's looking at bioinfrastructure for New York City. And if, if we are successful, uh, I hope I don't jinx uh, ourselves by, by putting this up. But you know, if we are successful, it would be a, a seven-year study, funded study, to look at New York City and the five boroughs and looking at the interplay of sort of the natural environment, the built environment, uh, looking at different uh, species and so forth, you know, uh, uh, and greenery and so forth. So uh, next, next slide. 
some of the some of the things I've been focusing on within this area is really housing and health. So as as the dean mentioned earlier, my interest in uh, gentrification and health more specifically. And so uh, a student who's a doctor student who's coming in, Carolyn Swoop and I have written. She was a master's student in public health a couple of years ago at, at Columbia, and now she's coming as a doctoral student. But we published uh, a chapter in a book that's coming out in the Urban Public Health, uh, a, tool, a research toolkit for practice and impact that'll be on Oxford University Press, but it's really looking at gentrification and health and thinking about the big questions and the methodologies that we should be uh, exploring in that area. And then most recently with another former student of ours, uh, Alexandra Moskovitz, we wrote an article, Urban Health in the Encyclopedia of Environmental Health. That was sort of a big article, but to talk about the, the, the sort of the future of urban health, the big challenges, the, the areas that we, we should be focusing on, and that just came out um, at the end of last year. And then obviously interested in COVID-19 and whatnot. So next slide. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but because there's a lot on the web that you can read about this, but I have a Columbia President's Global Innovation Fund grant that works with the uh, Santiago Global, Global Center, Columbia Global Center, to look at disaster management and recovery. Uh, if you wanna go to the next slide, Lila. So these are some of our partners that we're really working at the government level, the university level, and also the community level to look at how a community responds after a disaster. So in the case, Lila, you can just keep clicking. Um, in the case of Talca, a small community in, in Southern Chile, about three hours south of, of uh, Santiago and Santa Olga, which you see here, uh, you can stop there for a second, where a fire came through an informal settlement and within 24 hours wiped it out completely. There were about 10 deaths and obviously people lost everything. And now my students and I have been working with uh, Minvu as well as Onami, which is, Minvu is like the Department of Housing and Urban Development in the United States. Onami is like our, their FEMA, so to speak. And we've been working with them and colleagues at the Catholic University to kind of address, look at like the impacts in this community. But one of the things that my students found through some of their research was after these big disasters, it's women who come up and do the organizing. They do the planning, they feed the community. They are on top of what's happening in terms of the health outcomes and so forth. So it's really women who are at the, uh, the backbone and I'm sure all, all the women on the call on the Zoom are like, of course it's us. Um, but, it, it, but to document that and to really see it and the kind of labor, the dual labor that they're doing, they have jobs. And in some cases, one person even quit their job because they, had, they were so committed to this work, but they they're, have their main job, they have their, their home life where they have to do the cooking, cleaning, all those things. And they're also doing the organizing. So it's, it's, it's quite remarkable to see the impact uh, that residents have had in this community. And so these are older pictures, but if you uh, go to GSAP's website, you'll see some of the newer information that's come out about the, how the development's coming along. And I had uh, Shoshana Scheinfeld and um, Grace Dickinson who went as fellows for my lab last summer, which I paid for them to be there the whole summer to actually do a lot of this research with our colleagues. So go to the next slide and you can go to the next one. And then I, let, let me just talk about the economy and community development. So if you wanna to go to the next one, Lila, thank you. So one uh, last summer with uh, a doctor student Gayatri Kalral, we uh, taught a workshop looking at circular city, circular economy in London and New York. And what really came out of that was thinking about what would happen if, you know, it was a, similar to a project I was involved with at Berkeley, but really thinking about an eagle village. But what would happen if you took a uh, dilapidated housing development or even public housing or some housing that's obviously necessary in New York City and renovated it and make it actually a circular housing, right? And so to do all the things, maybe carbon neutral, put all the wonderful things in it, thinking about the different materials like our wonderful colleagues like David Benjamin and many others are, are working on in GSAP to say what would happen if you use mycelium bricks or you did smart controls and uh, gray water reuse and so forth. Uh, to renovate the building because whether it be public housing or some another type of building we know there are issues with pest and lead and and so forth but then also tie that to a broader workforce program that says look at a time when 30 to 40 million people are out of work are there opportunities to take that and also train local residents and so forth so obviously this is nothing new we had van jones talking about this we know uh aoc has been talking about this so but the idea is how do you then uh do that but more importantly as a researcher and i think this is where it's wonderful to be a researcher to say, well, do these things actually matter, right? And so you could potentially do a longitudinal study 
that would look at one development that was been renovated and made into a circular type of housing. And this would be a nat obviously a natural experiment because you couldn't do it, but if you, you were able to do that and then follow them over time, we can look at issues around health, meaning people's mental health, their physical health, their access to healthy foods. If you were to think about providing community gardens and whatnot, you could also look at educational attainment and outcomes. You could look at economic outcomes for residents. So there's a lot you could potentially do. And I would see that this is the kind of project that obviously would go well beyond me and, and in urban planning, but it, you would need colleagues in urban design and architecture and historic preservation and, and uh, sociology and women's studies. These are, the, these are the kind of things that we can think about as scholars to say what would happen over three to five years? Could you show that there's some impact over time? And what would this say about what we should be doing. Now, common sense tells you, of course this would make a difference, but how do you document it to prove it, right? How can you honestly say, and we'll never be able to say 100% like this building, but how could you then from the rigors of public health, the rigors of urban planning and architecture and all those, the things that we think about to say over time, this has made a difference, right? This is why you, as I was saying earlier, of why you need to make these investments. They may cost something upfront, but the long-term investment to society, the long-term financial investment for a city or a community is, uh, you know, whatever it's gonna be, but we know it can be a lot. So I'll stop there and then I'll just say the last piece, uh, uh, Moira O'Neill and, and, and I, but certainly the work she's been doing has been focusing on the circular economy and food systems in California and also uh, thinking about what's happening globally. So this is a project uh, this particular piece that you see now is from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation that wrote a piece on cities in the circular economy for food. Um, I've, I've had conversations with them about this and uh, not to put the dean on the spot, but they've also invited Columbia GSAF to be a part of their global network of universities, which is a very prestigious network. And uh, the dean and I have been talking about that. And so the paperwork's been sent to me and now it's navigating through the bureaucracy of Columbia more broadly. But the nice thing is Columbia University has been invited to be a part of this. It's a relationship I've been able to build with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and we hope to get all of GSAP students or as many as possible to be able to get involved in some way or at least know what's happening. So I'll stop there. Thank you. I didn't want to take up too much time. Thanks, Mallory. That was great. Hey, so um, we do have one comment in the chat. Uh, I wanted to just uh, check with each of you quickly. Um, Valerie, who's a current PhD, has submitted a discuss or some a, a point for discussion. I just wanted to possibly invite Ma Valerie to um, unmute her microphone and participate. Um, so I'm just going to give her that access now um, and ask her to unmute. Thanks so much. Yeah, I appreciate it. Hi, Malo. Hi, Hi Valerie. Valerie. Um, nice to see you both. Um, I, I have to say, I'm a bit disheartened to attend a session on a vision for the future of the PhD program um, and not hear any discussion of the impact of COVID-19 on the academy. I know among myself and my colleagues, we've already seen searches stalled, positions withdrawn, um, as well as just looking down the barrel of a job market that might not exist in the same way or at all coming this fall. And while um, I think that many of us uh, keep a foot in practice, I myself do quite a bit of community-based research for NG uh, nonprofit organizations and tenants, specifically in New York City, and that work is very important to me. Um, I did enter this PhD program with the intention of becoming um, a faculty member, and that I think that's the case for a number of my colleagues. Um, and that's looking to be increasingly unlikely. Um, I'd also just like to add that while I do believe that when you get a PhD and you pursue a PhD, it's definitely a part of your identity and it's hard to disassociate your work from your life. I also think it's important to emphasize that it is a material reality that we collectively face and that we, uh, we start a PhD program with the intention of earning our livelihoods from this research. And um, I think a number of us feel very scared about what that looks like in the face of a COVID economy. Um, so I would love to hear you speak a bit to that, if possible. Yeah, I think that, I mean, obviously that's an, uh, a great question. And by my not directly talking about the academy and this is by no means minimizing the importance of it. It's more of, we don't know. For me, it's, we don't know. We're in the middle of all of these things where are we going to have classes in the fall in person or not, right? We kind of have the answer to that maybe. 
uh, but there's no been no official announcement. I, I think one might come out today from Columbia. Uh, what does this mean for a year from now, two years from now? It's hard to say. It's having a major impact. I mean, my lack of, not that I don't care about the issue, is I don't know. Uh, you know, it's hard to say, we don't know. I think that when you pursue a PhD, obviously you put a lot into it, it costs a lot in terms of not just the physical, the, the financial, but family life, social life, all those things. And when I say it's part of who I am, it's a profession, it's a career, what you're describing, what you're asking about. And so I think that, um, I think the most important thing that I've been thinking about is how we can support our students is certainly through mentoring and networking, but right now it's networking and all those things are more important than ever because of some universities and certainly some firms I know are not in a position financially because there's uncertainty. So when there's uncertainty, they hold back on hiring. They don't, so they actually will say, I'm looking for someone uh, that does X, Y, and Z quietly. It's not public, right? And so I think that that's an area that we can try to support you all in. The, the real issue I think will be in another month or two to figure out where universities are going from going next. As you know, July 1 is the start of a new fiscal year for universities and what the financial realities are. From what I'm hearing from all universities, even the Columbia's of the world, the Harvard, everyone's taking a huge hit. And the question is then what does that mean in terms of thinking about higher education? So, there could be potentially, and this is, this is why I don't predict the future, but there are, these are things that have been floating around. Will it matter as much if you have faculty uh, in, in, in your, you know, at, physically at your university? If there's a Valerie who's a phenomenal scholar who lives in New York, but could teach at a university elsewhere abroad. That's a possibility. I know people are thinking about maybe we could hire faculty elsewhere that could teach. They don't necessarily have to be there. That's a huge cost. That's a huge savings for a lot of universities. They don't have to worry about trying to find new housing at this moment and all. Now, some people may not want to do that, but that's the rethinking of higher education and what it looks like. The other is, can you continue to provide uh, this type of learning online for another year or so? Right. If we are assuming a year to eighteen months, maybe we have a vaccine and we can start to do. What does that mean for uh, the way we do research? What does that mean for the way we teach, the pedagogy? I mean, it, it changes everything. And I think we're all, obviously this happened mid-semester. Uh, how do we adjust for that? We, faculty have been having lots of meetings over the summer and, and constantly about how we think about this. You doctoral students are thinking about this. So I would say, you know, not to go on and on, but it's just that, cause we don't, we don't know, we're in the middle of it. I think that it's important to advocate obviously for doctoral students, uh, but, I think we'll have a better sense of things in a month or two. I know that may not be a satisfying answer, but we're in the middle of this uh, and the financial realities are not there. And you know, one other thing that may be more important than even COVID-19 is this election. Because I think that the election will determine if you look at the big institutions, whether it be the Centers for Disease Control, the National Institutes of Health, uh, you know, we can go on and on, NSF, all the big funding sources, if they don't have the money to provide money for research or be able to support the kind of research that people are interested in, that also is a huge threat to the future of academia. So, but we'll, we'll talk more. I mean, I've, I've been thinking quite a bit about the doctoral program and certainly helping doctoral students. I know that uh, Liz and others are defending their dissertation this summer and they're thinking about these things and I, it, it's a critical issue. It's a critical mm -hmm. issue. And also the, the time on the clock and all those things. It's, yeah, we're, we're, it's not something we've forgotten about. Yes. We're all thinking about it. Yeah. Very, very hard. And we realize it's been really, really difficult. And we, we are really trying to think about it. So for sure. Thanks. Okay, with just a few minutes left um, on the clock here, uh, there are no additional questions in the chat. So I thought that maybe uh, Dean Andras, you wanted to final comments to wrap things up. Yes, sure. I wanted to, well, thank, thank you, Mauro. It's great to have you on the faculty. It's great to have you um, as I'm looking at a screen where only women are. <laughs> I think it's, uh, um, it's uh, you know, it's, I think it's a great, uh, it's a very important, even though it is an incredibly difficult time uh, right now for, for everyone, certainly for, for students, for doctoral students, for incoming students, for faculty, for staff, for um, uh, it's very difficult in terms of the future of higher education, although I am hopeful that there will be some, some good changes that will come out of this because there is, you know, in the same way that Malo, you've been 
even you know questioning what kind of society what kind of world do we want to live in i think we have similar questions that we can offer higher education and you know what kinds of transformation we will see um in in the coming month in the coming future and i'm i'm um, I, I really have great faith i have more faith in urban planners than i do in architects to uh transform uh the world in terms of uh um you know not so much uh, i think this process oriented thinking you know is really something um that is crucial right now uh, how do we engage with uncertainty and, and i think malo um you you have been doing this through your work um and even in today's kind of conversation not offering answers but offering ways to approach the question um is, is kind of crucial so I wanted to thank you. I'm excited to see, um, you know, how these difficult times are going to shape both the program and the school uh, in new ways in terms of how we think about our disciplines and how we practice uh, in new ways as well. Well, thank you for the opportunity. And, uh, you know, for, and for the doctoral students and those who have joined, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very challenging time, but I know that you've been committed all these years for you to the craft and it's, uh, you know, uh, it, it's pushing forward and, and trying to find a way to address some of these issues and also obviously thinking about your life and your career and, and all those things, an incredibly important time. So thank you everyone for joining uh, and to be continued in one form or another, uh, hopefully in a hybrid form. Uh, yes. That's my hope for the fall.